Shannon Taggart, thank you for joining us on Mystery Wire here. Um, photographer, uh, journalist, storyteller. Um, I'm sure you've got a few other titles you can go by. You've uh, put out a book called Seance. I believe it came out 2019. Is that correct? Yes. And then just this past couple of days, a, a new uh, exhibit began. Um, tell us just a, a little bit, give us a little background for people who have never come across your work. Uh, what is it that you do? Uh, so I am an um, artist and a photographer, and I have done a 20-year project on the religion of spiritualism. So I started uh, photographing and researching mediums. Uh, spiritualism is a religion that believes we can communicate with spirits of the dead. And it's, it was uh, started in America. It's a uniquely American religion that then spread across the Western world. And so I began a project about this in 2001, and I thought I'd spend a few weeks uh, photographing in Lilydale, New York, uh, which is a, a unique little town that's home to the world's largest spiritualist community. But to my surprise, it ended up becoming this um, huge um, visual project, text product re project, research project that uh, I still continue today. And the book that you put out um, goes into the history of the town, but also the history of how the events in the town were documented. And uh, at least for your part, that was mainly through some early photography, uh, some graphic work too. And then, and then it presents, and I assume that the, the uh, exhibit is the same, presents your work um, on documenting this activity in and around uh, Lilydale. How did this come about? How did Lilydale come about to being ground zero for this, for spiritualism like this? Uh, so in 1848 in upstate New York, not in Lilydale, but not far away outside of Rochester, New York, uh, the, uh, two young girls, Kate and Margaret Fox, claimed to be in contact with the spirit of a deceased uh, man who was haunting their home, at their, their small cottage in upstate New York. And they, and they uh, said they could communicate using coded raps with this spirit. And the neighbors came and everybody, um, lots of people in the town started witnessing this, uh, th what they said was spirit communication. And then they um, went to Rochester and publicly demonstrated this form of spiritual communication, which was nicknamed the spiritual telegraph. And uh, then it, it kind of sprang up into a movement and Lilydale was uh, became like a summer camp for spiritualists and people interested in, in this movement to go and, and um, gather. And so that's how the, the town initially was started. Has it always been about the seance? Um, and, and is there a misconception about what a, a seance is? I mean, I'm relatively new to this topic and all I know is what, I, you know, like they say, all I know is what I've seen on TV. Um, do I have the wrong impression? Uh, well, yeah, see what, uh, what we usually see on TV uh, with popular shows such as the Long Island Medium, mm -hmm. or you know, there's like the Hollywood Medium now, who's a, a young man, uh, and you know, Sylvia Brown has been a, a famous uh, medium on television. A lot of that is just people talking, uh, a medium in, just in a regular room, giving messages, just at, as if, um, just in a slightly altered state, maybe. But the history of seances, there was always. Um, an element where people would gather in dark rooms and turn off the lights and and um, try to see if they could manifest spirits, if, if the spirits could take form, move things around, tip tables, um, things like that. So there are, there's different aspects to spiritualism. And I was familiar with the, the message work like I saw on television, but I was wondering if there was people still around, still doing the Victorian era, the, the old, the late 1800 style seances. And I, I discovered that there were people st who still um, practiced this. And so I made photographs of a lot of, a lot of these practices, trying to document what was left of spiritualism today. 
And where you did that is, is that basically uh, some of the photos see, is it like a school for for mediums, for people trying to learn this or to, to cultivate their, their knowledge? Yes, actually a surprising thing I learned as I began studying mediums and spiritualism was that spiritualists believe that anybody can become a medium and that all mediums can develop their, whatever their natural gifts are even further. So they do have classes and schools and uh, one of the most famous and um, well-respected spiritualist school is a place called Arthur Finlay College, and that's located outside of London, England. And so in Lilydale, they do have classes too, but it's it's a town and the, the classes are all year round and dispersed, whereas when you go to Arthur Finlay College, it's uh, people come from all over the world to take week-long intensive classes. And they stay in this beautiful estate that was gifted to the Spiritualist National Union by a man named Arthur Finlay, who was a, a wealthy spiritualist. And he gave his estate to be run as a college for psychic studies. And it's a fascinating place. Did you have an opportunity to, I don't, I don't know what the terminology would be, but the, to try it yourself? on either the receiving or doing end? Uh, yes, throughout my um, project, I've been what, what you might call in anthropology or sociology as a participant observer. Mm -hmm. So um, even though I'm not a medium myself, uh, as I was involved in classes or sessions or of different types, I was um, asked to participate. And I did, I did um, go through the exercises and I found it, uh, although I did not become a medium, I found it really inspiring creatively. Um, and I really enjoyed uh, going through all the, all the classes and the training. And let's just get this question out of the way. You personally, do you believe it's real? Do you believe that there is communication happening with what you might call the other side? Um, what I, what I, how I usually um, answer this, it, 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 I say, oh, it depends on the day, because mm -hmm. the, the experiences I've had in spiritualism have really spanned the gamut, um, meaning I've seen some sessions that I are just very absurd or silly to me, or I'm not really, I don't think the medium is a genuine medium, although the, those are rare, um, but for the most part, I find um, sincere practitioners who sometimes resonate with me and sometimes do not. Uh, but I have had a lot of profound experiences. And so I definitely, um, I, I guess I would say, um, it's hard, it's hard to, um, I'm not trying to convince anybody to believe, but I, I have been open and I have had very um, fascinating experiences that make me question Yes. Mm -hmm. Now you consider yourself a professional photographer, photojournalist? Um, I began as a photojournalist and um, I was working in newspapers and uh, in, in public relations when I started this project. And the project actually um, became much more experimental and much more of an art project as I went on. and. I also learned that spiritualism has a really important role in the history of modern art. And um, all the, many of the artists I studied from had been influenced either directly or indirectly by spiritualist practices. And so as I learned more about the, these deep connections between spiritualism and art and modern art and photography, I began to experiment more. So now um, I don't really consider the project journalistic uh, in the sense that um, there's um, like it, it, it's hard to document spiritualism. A lot of times you'll be in a room with somebody who's describing an invisible person and having an invisible experience. So how do you really show that or make that come across in your visual storytelling? So that that became what my focus. And and that leads me to another question: is that a lot of your your photographs in the in the book and and on exhibit show what many would describe as, you know, there was, you know, a, another person, a, a form uh, there. Are you showing that you're, so what you're showing is art or are you documenting what 
you're seeing or are you documenting what the people believe they are experiencing? How would you describe that? Um, I would, I guess I would say, I'd have to say it's a both and. Mm -hmm. And the, um, the more I tried to play with um, visuals to, to, to try and describe what you couldn't see, I did have a lot of strange synchronicities with my with my camera, meaning um, if I did long exposure or, or, or I let, um, you know, different types of, of light flare, a, a lot of times I was getting accidental pictures that spoke to the to the actual the experience people were reporting. For example, uh, I was in a, a seance and people we were passing around a red light. And in spiritualism, they use red light um, to try to invoke a phenomenon called transfiguration, where um, they can see changes in somebody's face. So we were passing around this red light, and this woman had a red light, and everybody in the room saw a second face right next to hers that looked just like her, but kind of different. Oh, and, and they were saying, oh, it's your grandmother. Or maybe, it, oh, it's your, it's your etheric body. Oh, no, it's it's the voodoo priestess Marie Laveau. So everybody was seeing this, this figure next to her and I didn't see it. And I was at that time trying to make a very straightforward image. And when I got my film back, there was a second face right next to this woman's face, exactly as everybody had described in the room. And so this, this synchronicity uh, felt very important, even though it was something I didn't intend to do. And it, um, you can't explain why. I mean, obviously it was a, maybe a function of the longer exposure. We were in very low light, but still the, the meaning behind it, I couldn't deny. And so I've started to try to embrace that, that kind of aspect of my work. Now, many of the, the photographs that, that you feature, not your photographs, but at the beginning of the book um, about the history of basically documenting seances and spiritualism, uh, you know, this was well before digital cameras. These are well before even what we would consider film cameras, some of them, um, or old modern film cameras. Um, do you believe that these people that were documenting this stuff, you know, 100, 150 years ago, were they doing the same thing you're doing? Uh, or, or were they truly getting these mystical images back and, and trying to figure out really what was happening? Um, well, back was then, a little both. Yeah, um, so back then, there was real true faith that photography could show invisible things. And there was mm -hmm. reason um, to believe that that was possible. We, you know, with things like the x-ray showing the interior of the body, or, you know, they were having wireless communication happen with radio waves and, you know, with the telegraph and, you know, learning about through photographing through microscopes, um, germs and, and all of germ theory coming about. So there was a, there was a true mystery to photography and what it could possibly show. So there were very sincere experiments trying to photograph the spirit world. Um, a lot of these, these um, examples look like double exposure, what we now know or would say, oh, that's obviously double exposure, that's a manipulated negative, that's um, th those kind of things. Um, but I kind of look at that past as, it's almost become an iconography for spiritualism. The, the, these, these visuals, you know, as painting is to Catholicism, photography kind of became to spiritualism, they became these visuals to teach about what the spiritualists were believing. And a lot of those early spirit photographs, nobody's sure exactly how they did them. There was a lot of intrigue about trying to catch spirit photographers and, and there were lawsuits. And it's actually the, the first, um, the, the overlap of spiritualism and photography is the first thing that really calls in to photo the photographic reality into question, which you know we now know even as far along as we are with media, how we can be fooled. And even new ways every day that we are fooled by media. So, do you consider, or do, do you get the feeling the public considers that? I mean, obviously, back back then, you know, say 100, 150 years ago, someone might look at this and say, "Magic." Is that still? Is that still? I mean, I know in the popular culture that's not a thing, but 
you know, are you still trying to portray that, that, that there is something that you just can't explain? Well, yeah, I mean, I think there's, for me, um, I think there's something you can't explain about spiritualism, and there's also something you can't explain about photography. And when these two things come together, um, it can be really interesting. And um, one of the things I was astounded by is that there are still spirit photographers working today. You'll find them all over Facebook or, you know, on Instagram or in, in chat rooms or on threads on the internet sharing their photographs. And um, a lot of them, the, one of the most popular forms is called orb photography, where um, people say that they get orbs and it's not just about getting orbs, it's about communicating with orbs or asking the orbs to go to a pattern or zooming in on orbs and seeing symbols or faces. Uh, the whole orb uh, phenomena is really fascinating and there's a lot of sincere practitioners out there. Um, so part of my research is trying to identify and work with some of these modern day spirit photographers and interview them about what they're doing. And I have a collection of their work and I'm fascinated by it really. Some of the pictures are just really astounding. And, and you're now part of that group with what you've, you've documented. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm very, actually very influenced by all the modern spirit photographers. They're always yeah. playing with the edge of the technology and they're always spiritualists throughout uh, the history of spiritualism. They've always been playing with the spiritual um, possibilities of technology, which I think is a fascinating topic. Now in your time, obviously you've spent a lot of time around these, these folks that are doing this, that uh, are practicing this. Um, you go back through history and you've got Edison and Tesla uh, working on what was what they termed, I believe, the spirit phone. Um, so there's always been sort of this technological, you know, gist to, to what's happening, at least in modern, modern history. Um, do you think there's, I mean, and this is just, you know, your belief or, or you can speak to what other people have told you, um, you know, do you, or they believe that humans really can communicate with the dead? Um, and, you know, is there a part, you know, when we, you know, as the saying goes, when we die, uh, is there death or is there just something else? It's a big uh, question, but it's one that's being asked by a lot of people. Um, spiritualists say um, that death is not the end, it's a transition. And so that's all of their efforts in spirit. In, uh, if you're a spiritualist medium, all of your efforts would be um, to prove that there is a connection between life and death and that mm -hmm. we don't really die. We just go, we just evolve on or go into another state of being and that that state of being is accessible. Like our ancestors are dead, are, they're, they're around us and they're, we, we remain connected. And so for the most part, I, you know, I don't know percentage wise, but for the most part, I think the stereotype is that Oh, there's a lot of phony people who are trying to rip people off for money doing mediumship or, or you know, the, um, and for the most part, I found that I met very sincere practitioners who absolutely do believe they can communicate with the dead. There are, there is a small number of people who go around and do dark room seances and make things move and make spirits appear. And that, um, element of spiritualism is very provocative. A lot of spiritualists don't like that element. Um, th those mediums are considered very uh, scandalous or very controversial. Um, but for the most part, I, I spiritualists do truly believe that anybody can talk to their deceased loved ones. I've got a couple of questions about your photographs that are in the book and the, the exhibit. Um, and this again, coming from a layman's point of view looking at this going huh I don't know what that is I see in it I see in a lot of your photographs um what looks like a old-timey photo booth uh with curtains what is that okay so that's called a medium's cabinet okay and a medium's cabinet is a small uh a small box or like a, like a phone booth or a tiny stage that is uh, sectioned off for a medium to sit in Spiritualists believe that um, it condenses energy, it, it uh, 
it helps to you know draw in the the forces um, that might move things, move objects, move tables, or or, or um, allow the medium to embody a, um, a spirit. Uh, it's also used in stage magic. You know, um, one of the most famous and well-known magic tricks on the stage was called the medium's cabinet, and it was uh, every famous ma magician in the 20th century used to do a version of it. But the probable precursor of a medium's cabinet is uh, likely the Native American Indian shaking tent. So that um, that would be used in ceremonies. You know, the medicine man would um, throw up a, a tent made with bark and then cover the tent and would sit inside. And when the tent shook, you would know the spirits were there. And um, you could ask questions for guidance for the tribe. And, so this is, it, and this is currently used in, this isn't just a, an ancient practice, this is current, still used, right? Um, I don't know if, I, I am not aware if anybody's still using the shaking tent. Actually, it was, uh, those kind of ceremonies were outlawed and um, okay. made illegal, like right around the time spiritualists started to use the, the cabinets. So it's a very strange connection. Um, I have been to a Uweepi ceremony, which is a Native American Indian ceremony, where they wrap the 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 medicine man up in a blanket, so, um, and they tie him up. Uh, I think Uweepi means they tie him up, and the yeah. lights go off, and lots of wow. things happen. Uh, so that's like that's spiritualists say that's sort of like a medium's cabinet because the 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 medicine man's being condensed into this tiny space. Now another thing we see. Uh, sometimes in these same pictures, uh, otherwise you've got a couple of beautiful pictures just of them by themselves are uh, what look like cones, almost like a, a dunce cone or a horn of some sort. I, explain, and, and, and in fact, one of them, that one of the photographs you have uh, has a one with a picture of Michael Jackson on it. Uh, oh. <laughs> so I got a couple questions there, <laughs> but uh, so, so what are these things? Okay, so the cones, um, th those are called spirit trumpets. And um, they were like those uh, spiritualists believe. So it's a it's a cone like um, structure, either silver or sometimes they use cardboard. Um, that spiritualists believe that if the spirits come, they can speak through the cone. So and they're likely modeled after the early hearing aids. Um, so early hearing aids would be a very similar cone that you would put in your ear so you could hear better. Um, so spiritualists use these in seances, and um, they say that um, the the energy can build up inside, and spirits can speak with a voice through through them. And so the one with Michael Jackson is. Uh, so I have a picture of one of these with a painted Michael Jackson, and that is spiritualists often communicate or say they communicate with dead celebrities. And this has happened in spiritualism since the very beginning. And currently Michael Jackson is a popular spirit that um, some mediums say they can talk with or want to talk with. Hmm. And by popular, do you mean popular for the mediums or popular for the, the people seeking this out? Um, I guess what I mean is I've been to, I started probably around 2013 at, mm -hmm. in my travels. I was traveling around to different um, seances and I started to notice Michael Jackson was popping up. You know, some people were saying he was coming and giving messages or, or saying that they had been to a seance and he was there. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I started kind of trying to track that. And Freddie Mercury is another popular um, visitor also. Louis Armstrong, he's another popular one. Now, speaking of celebrities, um, an another photograph you have is a photograph of a note, it appears, or a writing um, that is uh, apparently, uh, I don't know what I want to say, uh, the words of Elvis. Yes. Uh, this, this rings true to, we're in Las Vegas and have a <laughs> definite Elvis connection here. Uh, what, what, uh, what's the story with Elvis? Uh, so the the note that you're speaking of in the book, I met a medium named Myra Basie, and she said that she's been doing uh, writing as El 
Elvis will come to her, take over her hand and write notes through her. And I found this fascinating and she allowed me to photograph that process. And um, so one of those notes that she wrote as Elvis uh, helped her hand is in the book. And yeah, Elvis also has, um, you know, people have claimed to be speaking to Elvis for a long time in, in mm -hmm. culture, not even just in spiritualism. There's a man named um, Raymond Moody who wrote a book called Elvis Afterlife. He's he's actually the person who coined the, the, the phrase near-death experience. And he wrote a book about people's experiences with Elvis because he found so many of them during his research. And so that's a fascinating book, Elvis Afterlife. It's definitely a, another avenue for people to go down on this, uh, on this topic. Um, couple of just uh, technical questions that I know I have them I'm sure other people uh, the uh, what kind of camera gear do you use when you're taking is it digital film a special type of camera what are you using um I started out using film and now I use digital and people always ask what do I think is better or what's more appropriate for photographing a seance I actually prefer digital because I'm not limited to um, reloading my camera, you know, I can, I can store a lot more. And also digital cameras are better for low light. I can really pick up a lot more <laughs> in the low light um, dark areas than I could on film. Mm -hmm. uh, I, the dynamic range is wider. And so I've been enjoying experimenting with digital photography. And I think a lot of those photographers I mentioned why they're, why they're still going on is because of the ease and availability of the digital media. Yeah, everyone's got uh, got one in their pocket right now. You know, it's, uh, it's everywhere. Yeah. Um, there's another photograph I wanted to ask you about, and this is where you had a personal experience. Uh, the, uh, the photograph just shows, a, I believe, a styrofoam cup with a penny in it and some yeah. coffee residue, maybe. Now, I read the, the background on this one. It's fascinating, but tell us, why did you take a picture in a seance book of a penny in a coffee cup? Well, um, spiritualists, there's a, a term called apport, and that it's, um, that's when spiritualists believe that objects can materialize um, and dematerialize, um, and that would be an apport. And okay. I've been told about a lot of airports. I've been shown airports, and I never had an airport experience until this. And I was at the Arthur Finley College in England, and we we took a tea break, and I made myself a cup of tea, and I made the tea myself. I so and it was from a stack of cups, and I I took my teacup out of the stack, turned it over, looked in, made my, made a tea, and brought it into my classroom. And I was sitting next to a woman from Norway and I didn't have any of my American money on me. I didn't even have my wallet on me. And when I got to the end of my teacup, there was an American penny with Abraham Lincoln on it at that as, and I didn't notice until my last sip of tea. And this was so shocking. Uh, I couldn't believe it. And I, I kind of went, oh my God. And everybody around me was like, oh, it's an airport there. And, you know, and it, you must be, it must be Abraham Lincoln wants to say hello because uh, Abraham Lincoln, um, it's, it was said to have hosted seances at the White House with his wife, Mary Todd. And spiritualists believe that he was a spiritualist, even though he wasn't publicly on record as a spiritualist. So they explained to me that's probably what happened, but it was a really shocking experience. It was, I couldn't figure out how that penny got into the teacup. Did you keep the penny? I did keep the penny. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be good luck then. It's got to be. <laughs> so, so, so sort of a, a bigger picture question um, relating to at Mystery Wire, we cover a lot of things, you know, everything mysterious, as we say. But, you know, that includes UFOs, aliens, encounters, um, afterlife. You know, it's, it, it all kind of, after a while, it all kind of blends together. Yes. Um, you know, everything from just the experience that just sounds, no pun intended, out of this world, to photographs. I mean, we have lots of people, I mean, thousands of people that are taking 
photographs or video of things that they can't explain. Um, and I'm sure that in, in the spirit photography world, you know, people probably get, you know, there's probably a bit of ridicule. Um, people say, oh, I got this image of, you know, my grandpa or, or something, you know, oh, no, you didn't. it's just a double exposure, as you were saying, you know, and the same thing in the ufology or alien ET world. Do you feel that your exhibit, your book is helping open that door up? Not the not a spiritual door, but a, a door for people having this discussion about what's out there. Because that's the in, in our world in the in the UFO world, that's that's sort of been the case these past few years. We've had many doors opened up to where it's become a the stigma is going away a little bit. And and you know, looking at your history, you know, you can uh, or not your history, but the history of spiritualism. I mean, there's definitely been prosecution around that throughout the years. I mean, it's just it's got a stigma. Do, do you feel that you're advancing that, not making more, but opening the door a little bit more? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I do hope, that is one of my hopes to broaden the conversation. Mm -hmm. And what I try to make the point always is that when I first started spiritualism, like researching it, I had no idea that some of the most interesting minds in the 19th and 20th century were interested in spiritualism. Some of the most famous scientists um, studied seances like, uh, like the Curies, you know, Nobel Prize winners. Uh, the, a Nobel Prize winner in medicine is the man who, who coined the term ectoplasm. And that they're the very first abstract artists were actually spiritualist mediums. We're finding that out now that spiritualism was um, hugely important for the women's rights movement, like things like this. We, it, it, these topics are constantly lumped into uh, anti-intellectual kind of, or, or that you have to be gullible to be interested or have an experience with them. So um, I try to make that point about the history and um, broaden the conversation. So I, I, I hope that this does. And I do think there's a lot of connections between UFOs and, and mediums and spiritualism as well. I don't, there's a little bit of that in my book, but um, you often find mediums have had UFO experiences or, or sometimes um, people who've had UFO experiences also see dead loved ones or Whitley Strieber just recently wrote a book about communication with his deceased wife and how there's overlaps between his experience and also um, with the visitors and with speaking to the dead. So I think there's a lot, there's a lot more to explore with all of these topics and hopefully. Um, in, we'll... in your experience, did you find people looking for, you talk about the Whitley Strieber, uh, you know, did you find other people looking for those sort of answers, looking for that closure, using this as a, a channel to get that? Um, the, I think now more than ever, people are becoming more aware of all the interconnections mm -hmm. um, between the, or maybe for some reason that conversation is being sparked. I mean, I certainly think uh, Whitley Strieber's book helps with some of that. Um, unfortunately, though, it's I, I really don't have any answers. I always say this project just gave me more questions. <laughs> The, they answer, always do. <laughs> the deeper I go in, the more questions I have, but I guess that's what's fascinating about these topics. Yeah. Um, one more serious question um, on kind of a, and a strange tie into modern, uh, modern uh, films. Um, you might say let's cross the streams a little bit. You uh, have probably heard this question. You, you have some old photographs of what uh, people claim to be ectoplasm. You just mentioned that coming out of people's mouths. Um, and uh, I know you explore that a little bit in your photography too. But explain that to us. I mean, that to me, I, I look at that. And again, I'm looking at it as a layman. I look at that and I see, okay, someone's holding a clock coming out of their mouth or something in those old photographs. Yeah, what, so, what, what's happening there? Um, so ectoplasm, which, uh, you know, the first time I ever heard the word ectoplasm was through Ghostbusters. Right. And uh, I came to find out that Dan Aykroyd is actually a fourth generation spiritualist. And so he's drawing the term ectoplasm from spiritualist history. So ectoplasm is, um, it's, 
a substance that's supposed to merge life and death and that can um you know come forth and and come into the seance room and take form and a lot of times you see it as hands or something that looks like a cheese cheesecloth coming out of a, a person's mouth or i mean the images of ectoplasm are really very absurd and very um shockingly strange i mean some of the strangest images i think i've ever encountered in the history of photography are the early ectoplasm images i mean some of them are very like the mediums will be half naked with these these gooey like things popping out all over and um so ectoplasm is a symbol of life and death meeting. And some, some spirituals believe the ectoplasm in those pictures is absolutely real. Others believe it was faked for the camera, but it's still a real substance. Mm -hmm. You know, it's ectoplasm is a controversial topic and a controversial substance. And I spent a lot of time going around to see if I could find people who are said they were using ectoplasm in, in this modern era. And I did discover there were. Now, you, you mentioned uh, Dan Aykroyd. Uh, he actually wrote, I believe, the, the foreword for your book. Yeah. How, how, how did that, how did you, I mean, obviously, you know the connection, but how did you get that connection? Um, so, so yeah, so Dan Aykroyd is a fourth generation spiritualist, and his father is actually a spirit, or was a spiritualist researcher, and he wrote a great book called The History of Ghosts, um, <laughs> that I was a big fan of before I even met, um, met them, but they were up in Lilydale and I met the family there. They were doing kind of a exploring like a research trip. And so that's how we we connected there. And I got to meet his father, Peter, who um, knew, knew just about everything in the history of spiritualism. So uh, it was very fun to talk with him because I love to research as well. And yeah, so that's how we connected. That's awesome. Um, tell us a little bit, nuts and bolts, uh, your, your exhibit of your photographs. Where is it? When is it? How can I see it either in person or I believe online as well? But give us the details. Okay, so um, there's an exhibition of my photographs from the book Seance is at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County in Baltimore. Uh, it's UMBC for short, and it is it opened August 31st it will be on display until December 17th. And on October 14th, I'm doing an artist talk that will be broadcast for free online that you can sign up for. There will be a sign up if you if you can't make it to Baltimore. But if you're anywhere near Baltimore, you can go see the photographs installed. Very nice. And the book is still available uh, most places online, my, correct? My book is out of print right oh, now. No. Hopefully, hoping to get it back into print. <laughs> but unfortunately, the book is out of print. But uh, you can see some of my photographs at my website, shannontaggart.com. And I also have a mailing list there. All right, Shannon, thank you very much for taking a few minutes with us. Thank you for having me. It was wonderful. Thank you.